Well, thank you very much. It's nice to be here. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, it's a real pleasure. I don't do any hep C work, but I hope that by the end of today, I'll have lots of opportunity to begin some interactions. Uh, certainly the question about uh, co-infection would be something that would be very, very interesting to us. Um, we use various microscopes uh, that allow us to image what happens within the liver. Uh, we usually use spinning disc, although we also use two photon. And what the spinning disc uh, microscope allows us to do is because there are pinholes uh, within uh, this little spinning disc, it allows us to capture images very, very quickly rather than doing a rostral screen the way a two photon might do. And you'll see why this is important in a second. Um, we then image the, uh, the liver, and so the blue, of course, are the sinusoids, the, the, there's the hepatocytes, and our images actually look quite a bit like this cartoon. The green are the hepatocytes, these dull green cells. The blue are our sinusoids. We've taken an antibody that labels the sinusoidal endothelium, PCAM1. The, the big purple cells are the Kupfer cells. They live right inside the sinusoids. And then the green guys in this particular case are a reporter mouse that reports on INKT cells. This population continuously patrols. If you have, for example, a small tumor growing here, these cells become quite interested when activated uh, uh, in various ways. Now, I think that the liver is the center of the universe. And usually, I'm talking to immunologists, so uh, they don't get it. Um, but having said that, I show them this slide, which is uh, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, uh, GFP labeled. And I tell them that when you look at where this uh, staph goes, uh, what they're studying is in the little black dots down here. And what I'm studying is this red bar right here. And that's because of Kupfer cells. If you inject Staph aureus, Kupfer cells will catch about 98% of all bugs that go through the vasculature first pass. So they're an incredible, incredible cell. Um, staph, of course, fights back. And so the big green blob is not a Canadian staph. It's a colony of staph, OK? And the staph is actually growing right inside this Kupfer cell. And you can show that it's growing because if you take GFP staph, you dunk it in blue, you can see some blue cells, but you can also see some light blue cells. You can see some light green cells and some green cells. These cells are replicating right inside the Kupfer cells. Okay, they've taken full advantage of this situation. And you can see that they're doing it inside the phagolysosome. So we can now image red if the pH is going down around these uh, bacteria. And you can see that's where they're uh, replicating. And we can show that they're actually replicating right inside these, uh, uh, these uh, vesicles. Now, the blue guys are neutrophils, the purple are Kupfer cells, the green is a bacterium, and the neutrophils run right past these infected cells. They don't see them as long as the staph is hiding inside. Every so often, we can actually watch one of these Kupfer cells lice. And when they lice, then what happens is these blue neutrophils come charging in. You can see this guy's really hungry. He takes up most of the food and runs off. I have someone in my family like that, and, and eats up most of the staph. OK? Um, and the good news is we can still treat methicillin-resistant staph aureus. You just give vancomycin, right, for six weeks, IV. And it's not clear why have to, we have to take such draconian approaches. Well, if you look at now a stitched image, so each one of these little green dots is a large colony of staph. And the uh, images are stitched together. So I'm showing you 64 images of the liver. And if we give vancomycin pretreatment, we eradicate staph. OK? Isn't that great? The problem is, you guys are clinicians. I'm not. So I didn't realize that patients don't come to you and say, I'm getting staph tomorrow. <laughs> and so if you just give staph one hour if you, after, uh, before the vancomycin, then this is what it looks like. You've done nothing. So the vancomycin is actually not getting in effectively into the Kupfer cells to kill the staph. And you can see that here we have red staph inside this Kupfer cell. You now add a green antibiotic, vancomycin bodipi, 
and they should all turn green, but they don't because they're hiding from this antibiotic. If you now put in fresh new staff, they'll come in and you can see the green staff because now they're exposed to vancomycin, but the rest of the staff stays red. They cannot be affected by vancomycin. So the question is, how do you get more more vancomycin into these kupfer cells. And so we did a little trick. Uh, we fooled the kupfer cells into thinking that these liposomes kind of looked like bacteria, filled them with vancomycin, gave it a fancy name, that's important apparently, called them vancosomes, okay? Vancomycin and liposomes. And now we could deliver them very effectively the blue are being taken up by all of these kupfer cells. So you see this poor colony of staph not growing very well because of all the vancomycin that's now inside the kupfer cell. And that reduces uh, by an order of magnitude the amount of staph that's now in these mice uh, and actually really helps them not to get killed by the staph. Now I'm going to tell you something obvious. You only see what you label. Okay, and a lot of people ask me, hey, do you see platelets in your system? And I say, no, no, but we don't label them. So one day we decide to label them, and what we saw was fascinating. These little red dots are actually platelets, and in the liver, they'll come into view and disappear, come into view and disappear. And if you, in fact, label the Kupfer cells blue, what you can see is these red platelets skimming off the surface of all of these Kupfer cells. We found that fascinating. Uh, you could see, for example, here's a platelet touches down on a Kupfer cell, one second, two seconds, and gone again. So it just touches down and leaves. Why is it doing that? And so what we did was we actually looked at all the different organs, because we can image them all, and it's only in the liver that it's doing this. The liver is the only one with Kupfer cells. And what's interesting is that Kupfer cells grab von Willebrand factor. It's thought to be the clearance mechanism, but in fact, they keep it on their surface. And now, if you watch, when a blue, uh, you can use staph or bacillus or any bug, when it adheres to the Kupfer cell, what you can see is the platelets immediately encapsulate that Kupfer cell and help to eradicate this infection. And so you can see this aggregation happening very quickly, and if you deplete with the von Willebrand factor or inhibit it, now these platelets aren't able to come in, and what you end up with is a much bigger load of, uh, of bacteria. And the animals actually die much quicker if you deplete platelets, for example, in these mice. The other thing the platelets like are other immune cells, and so this is, again, these platelets trafficking through, and you can see this blue as a neutrophil, and the neutrophil is sort of minding its own business, but the second you add a viral ligand, TLR3 ligand, for example, or TLR4 ligand, the platelets almost attack these neutrophils. They actually surround them, and it's really very, very obvious. And what is this interaction doing? And this is where imaging is a, a really powerful because we would have never thought to look at this interaction otherwise. And in fact, if you take a close look, and I'm jumping ahead five years now, but these neutrophils, as they bind platelets, actually become hyperactivated and actually release most of their contents, including their DNA. This is called a neutrophil extracellular trap, and actually Craig Jenny at our institute has shown very nicely that if these nets are actually released, they reduce the ability of a virus to leave one cell, traffic, and find another cell. So I think that these, uh, these uh, traps, these DNA structures can be pretty extensive. You can see these blue um, bacteria getting caught up in these structures, and then, of course, the neutrophil comes along and eats them up. Now, for the second part, what I'd like to do is uh, tell you a little bit about sterile injury, okay? Sterile injury is not infectious, but we think that there's a lot to be gained from understanding this for viral infections, for cancer, and for autoimmune disease. And so, sterile injury comes in all kinds of flavors, Okay, here's two I pulled off Google yesterday. So here is smoking, here is drinking way too much. Okay, so you're killing your liver, you're killing your lungs, and our immune system has not learned to deal with this. And so when people tell you that neutrophils kill, they're probably right because when they see this, they don't know what to do with it. I don't know what to do with it. So, uh, and then there's the other kind of sterile injury, which is trauma, right? Now, again, not very smart, but 
It's trauma, and we've learned to deal with this. We either heal or we die. So there's two different kinds of sterile injury. And so we decided to try and understand what sterile injury with a normal repair mechanism looks like. We thought it'd be very easy to do, and we were completely wrong. So what we did was we lowered a thermal probe to the surface of the liver and killed about 200 cells, okay? By doing that, we asked, can the immune system see self? And when it does, what does it do? And so here's a video. Red is dead cells, green are neutrophils, and I think you'll agree that our immune system recognizes dead cells, okay? This almost seems like a little bit of overkill, okay? And you can see these cells adhere, they run through the sinusoids, and they all go running towards these dead cells. Now we spent a lot of time characterizing this, and what you can see is that there's the activation of the inflammasome, the cells crawl along these sinusoids, they reach an area that's platelet rich, move across these platelets, and enter into this dead area, okay? Now the question was, what are they actually uh, doing there. And the reviewer said, you know what they're doing there is they're killing. They're causing a lot more damage. Get rid of the neutrophils, you'll be way better off. What they're doing basically is injuring. And so what we have neutrophils for is the following, okay? To punch ourselves in the face, to hurt ourselves more. And I'm sorry, I don't believe that that's the way evolution works. And so we started investigating what neutrophils actually do in these sites of sterile injury. Why are there so many there? And so these are patent, patent sinusoids. Here is the dead cells. And if you watch, the, uh, if you inject FITC albumin, these are patent vessels, a little bit of green FITC albumin accumulating. And in here are dead vessels. They're not perfused at all. And if you watch, the neutrophils surround this area, okay? And what they begin to do is dismantle the dead cells. And so you can see here, they're removing the vasculature. They're working away at eating away all the vasculature. They form these nice lines, one after another, and eventually make the sleeves where you get revascularization. Okay? So they're not there to injure us whatsoever. And in fact, if you take a look, once they form these sleeves, then they begin to pay their attention to these dead uh, green cells, and they begin to eat little vesicles, little particles of the dead cells, okay? And so if you don't allow this to happen, you don't get nice matrix deposition, okay? and you don't get healing. So here, after seven days, it's very, very difficult without a microscope to see anything here, if you deplete neutrophils, then you have much larger injuries. The neutrophils come in, and by 24 hours, they're gone, okay? And textbooks will tell you that monocytes and macrophage eat them up. And so we've been imaging this a lot, the blue and the red cells, and you don't see the red monocytes eating up the blue neutrophils just doesn't happen in our, under our microscope. Maybe we're missing something, but if you deplete monocytes, okay, using a CCR2 deficient mouse, all right, no, the neutrophils get depleted just as effectively. If you deplete macrophage, the neutrophils are depleted just as effectively. So neither monocytes nor macrophage are eating up our neutrophils. What are they doing? Now there's a couple of papers, Anna Hottenlocker showed that if you injure uh, a fish embryo, the, the fin, a neutrophil will come out, look at it, and jump back into the circulation. Very cool observation, but a fish embryo, right? Well, it happens also in our model. If you actually watch, here's the injury in blue, here in red are patent vessels, watch the blue guys start leaving. They've done their job and they actually go back into the circulation. And you can see that and you can catch it just at the right time. At 16 hours, they all make this mass exodus. You can actually photoactivate a little portion of the mouse. So now you photoactivate, you shine UV light, this area becomes green, and you can watch these green guys slowly line up and start leaving the vasculature, okay? Here's one, he's about to leave. Here's the next one, here's the next one, here's the next one. They all line up and start leaving. And then they end up, most of them, in the bone marrow, okay? Um, so, 
our idea that neutrophils go there to injure actually isn't true at all. They actually go there, they play a very important role, and then they leave. How am I doing on time? Okay, I'll try this in four minutes. Um, just the last point that I want to make is we've started collaborating with uh, Professor Ynez, um in Spain, and he used this, this DDC-fed uh, uh, model where you injure but chronically. You got this chronic injury, these ductules get plugged, and you get these progenitor blue cells growing. The red neutrophils surround these cells, and for some reason, they attack these cells and they don't leave. We're trying to understand what are the cues that now keep them there to cause this chronic injury. I hope uh, you don't walk home at night late, Carla, because this is what you might encounter, okay, especially if one wakes up early, so be careful. So the last point I want to make is a little bit about monocytes, because many people say, well, why are you studying neutrophils, okay? And there's two types of monocytes. There's the inflammatory monocyte, and there is the less inflammatory repair monocyte, if you will. One is CCR2 positive, and so we have reporters for this mice, and you can see where there's an injury, which is over here, where the white is, these red monocytes come charging in through the sinusoids, and they form these beautiful rings around the injury site. And if you don't have CCR2, they don't get there. If you now use the reporter mouse CX3CR1 GFP for the kinder, gentler, repair type monocyte, what you see is that they form a ring around the injury too, but it's delayed by 24 hours. So first you get the red cells, then you get the green cells. And what's embarrassing to us is we could never see a single green cell go there. We couldn't understand why not. This is embarrassing for an imaging lab. And what we found out was when we put the reporter on the same mouse, so you have the red, red cells coming in first, then the green, if you put the red and green on the same reporter, actually many of your cells become yellow. Okay? And you can see that right here. Many of these cells are turning from red to green. And so right in that area, they're getting educated, they're being told it's time to switch from an inflammatory to a non-inflammatory monocyte. And you can see that here, you've got cells that look uh, red, orange, yellow, green. My students love to spin things, I don't know why, but you can see that all there. And if you block the red cells from getting in, the green cells don't arrive either. And this switch can be delayed by the right kind of cytokine, so we can manipulate this switching. We've also uh, seen that if you delay the switch, you delay the matrix deposition and the revascularization. Where is this relevant? For example, liver cancer. When we looked at the blue tumors surrounded by these red monocytes and we used our double reporting, within 24 hours, the majority of these have been switched to a kinder monocyte. And so delaying this process will be important if we want to fight some of these tumors. And what is causing this phenotype switch? Well, I'll just tell you very briefly. We think it's these migrating I and KT cells. They roam around within these liver sinusoids. They actually can make potent inflammatory cytokines like interferons, but they can also make IL-10 and IL-4 if stimulated by self antigens. And we believe that given the right signal, these NKT cells respond appropriately. And so what you're seeing here is the mighty INKT cell, here's the injury. When you have a name like natural killer cell, you expect a tough cell to show up, right? Watch this, watch how tough this NKT cell is. It comes running up, it sees this injury, whoop, turns around and runs away, and they all do it. And they do it for about eight hours, but then they become a little more brave, they start surrounding this injury, and they form a very nice ring exactly where those monocytes were. And if you actually watch them, they now surround this area. I got one minute left. And you can actually see that these uh, INKT cells are receiving antigen, self-antigen, because if you now put them on a, if you deplete CD1D or you block CD1D, these cells migrate right into the injury, back out, and they don't know how to localize around this injury site. And if you now take a look, if you don't have NKT cells, then the switch of the monocytes doesn't happen. So we think these INKT cells are critical for switching us from inflammatory
to non-inflammatory repair mechanisms. Targeting that will be important when we want to repair an autoimmune disease. And so I think I'll stop there. I didn't talk then at all about peritoneal macrophage, but we just published this year that peritoneal macrophage actually infiltrate the liver when there's an injury, and they can actually help in the repair process as well. I told you a little bit about neutrophils. I showed you the switching of monocytes by NKT cells, and I'll stop there. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for that talk, Paul. Um, could we have some questions, please? Carla. Thanks, Paul. It's super cool. You make George Lucas jealous. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> so what would happen, what would you speculate would happen if you have a diseased liver, such as fatty liver disease and with the immune cell trafficking? You sort of alluded to the work you do with, with Pierre Genes and the cholangitis model. What, what are your thoughts? Uh, so what, what we're thinking is that um, uh, it, it's interesting, these neutrophils will come in because they sense bacterial products in a sterile injury, and that was always bizarre to us. It's actually mitochondrial products, mitochondria are ancient bacteria. So they come in there, but then they don't find the right cues, or they do their job and they leave. They're not stimulated as if there was an infection there. We think in some of these other injury models where you've got this chronic death going on, uh, you have other cues that are actually telling the neutrophils to stick around, don't leave. We're now photoactivating those neutrophils sitting on those progenitor cells and seeing for how long do they sit there for. They should be gone by 16 hours, and our preliminary data suggests they're there for a much, much longer time. And so we think they're actually injuring in that model. In a fatty liver, it's, we're, we're trying to do that right now. It's incredibly difficult to image fat. It's very autofluorescent, and so we're using three-week-old mice to try and understand some of these processes. Uh, it's challenging, yeah. So we think, again, a lot of these uh, activations uh, and, and uh, from inflammatory to less inflammatory doesn't happen. There's this chronic underlying cue that prevents that from happening, yeah. Just a couple more quick questions and answers. Um, so do the pro-inflammatory macrophages take up or express less um, von Willebrand's factor on their surface than the tissue repair macrophages? Uh, so they're not responsible for taking up von Willebrand. It's the Kupfer cells that do all of that. Mm -hmm. And so the monocytes, uh, to be honest, we haven't really looked because um, they weren't there when we were looking under basal conditions. Under basal conditions, it's the Kupfer cells that are constantly harvesting this von Willebrand factor and taking it out of the circulation, free-floating von Willebrand factor. I don't know whether the inflammatory uh, monocytes actually catch von Willebrand factor. Do you find that based on where the macrophages are found in the sinusoid, they, they clear less of these complexes? Is, do you see zonation in the phenotype of the um, cup for cells? Uh, no, not that we really could see, obviously. Um, yeah, maybe we need to go back and check further, yeah. And our last question, please. Uh, yeah, I had a quick question about the neutrophils. Uh, it's not an homogeneous population. They can differentiate also to N2 that are more regulatory, and they have also Horgamati producing neutrophils. So have you tried to find which one are recruited in the more acute injury model versus the chronic model, for instance? Yeah. Um, so you and Lorne are N1, N2. <laughs> And I think that actually this N1, N2 paradigm in neutrophils is a young neutrophil, perhaps, and perhaps uh, a slightly older neutrophil. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so I'm not sold on the idea that in the circulation we have an N1 and an N2 population. Mm -hmm. um, I think that maybe in an environment like a cancer environment, you might start developing Neutrophils, you might start changing the phenotype of the neutrophil a little bit so that it's less aggressive. Uh, but I don't think they're recruited as N1, N2, and I don't think anybody has any evidence, yeah. and I go out on a limb here, that N1, N2 are recruited differentially. Okay. I think it's the local environment. That's my theory. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Paul. Thank you.